Chief are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stu Ellis. I'm with Grain Journal Magazine in Decatur, Illinois, and we give you a very warm welcome to today's webinar. This is the very first in a series of four operational webinars being presented uh, this year by Jim Voigt, president of JFV Solutions Incorporated of Mount Zion, Illinois. The webinar will provide an introductory level examination of the operational functions and issues related to grain handling for grain, feed, flour, and grain processing facilities, and will include a review of how grain operations fits into the food, feed, and fuel supply chain as well as covering facility types, equipment, and operational procedures. The subject matter of the four webinars taken directly from material found in the upcoming Jeeps K-State Distance Education course known as Jeeps 500, Introduction to Grain Operations. It will serve as a sneak peek, if you will, into the course content. And this course is one of six that are necessary to obtain the Grain Operations Management Credential, the industry's only credential in the field of grain operations. Our webinar series, which is sponsored by the Grain Elevator and Processing Society, Jeeps, and the Grain Journal Magazine, is suitable for newer employees, non-operational employees who would benefit from understanding more about the handling portion of the business or any other individuals who could benefit from an introductory level exposure. Our webinar today will feature about 30 minutes of lecture from Jim Voigt to be followed by your questions and his answers. Our webinar today sponsored by the Food Protection Alliance, a network of regional companies in North America aligned to provide excellence in pest management, food safety, preventative techniques, fumigation services, continual education training, and more, along with Gamut Sampling System Solutions of St. Paul, Minnesota, a manufacturer of sampling equipment since 1937. Now, Jim Voigt, recently retired from the Archer Daniels Midland Company, where he is, in his 28-year career, he held various positions, including Director of Manufacturing for ADM Feeds, Vice President of Operations and Engineering for the Domestic and International Grain Handling Facilities, and Co-Founder of ADM's Continuous Improvement Team. Jim's a lifelong member and past International President of Jeeps. He was in that leadership position in 2001-2002. He's a graduate of California Polytechnic State University, which you know as Cal Poly, and has a degree in agricultural business management. Now, JFB Solutions Incorporated provides working solutions to challenges facing grain and bulk commodity handling facilities. And over 38 years of operational experience blended with continuous improvement management concepts allows JFB Solutions to assist you in improving the performance of your operations. You can contact Jim at jfvsolutions at hotmail.com. That's his email address, jfvsolutions at hotmail.com. You can also contact him at his telephone number, which appears on your screen now. It's area 217-855-4534. Jim's presentation is going to be about a half an hour. And we'll have a 30-minute session afterwards for questions and answers. We certainly invite you to submit your questions at any time. You can type them into the question box. You can find that at the right-hand side of your screen uh, during the webinar. And at this point, we're wanting to launch a bit of a poll that will appear on your screen asking about how many people are viewing the webinar at your location. You may be the only one. You may have a whole raft of your colleagues that are watching. Uh, please uh, mark down the appropriate number uh, as close as you can estimate. And uh, that gives us a, a real good idea to help plan for future webinars. A lot of you will always ask uh, if the webinar is being recorded. And the answer is yes. 
It will be posted to our website uh, within about 24 hours. We've got some technical issues that we do need to take care of. We're not changing the content at all, but um, uh, give us about a day and the webinar will be on our website and that is the three W's dot grainnet dot com G-R-A-I-N-N-E-T dot com and uh, we are just about ready. Jim, uh, you're on the line uh, with us, are you not? Yes, I am. Great. We uh, certainly appreciate you being here today and uh, can you show us the uh, the slides that you'll have? All right, we'll bring oh. those right up. And uh, very well, great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're honored to present to you today Jim Voigt. Thank you for the introduction, Stu, and thank you, Grain Journal, for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of my knowledge today. Uh, <clears throat> as Stu mentioned, this class is an introductory level. <clears throat> it, I might uh, one thing here before I get started. I'm, I'm fighting a little bit of uh, an illness here right now, so my voice is breaking a little bit, and I apologize for that. If I'm if I cough frequently or something through here, I'll try to keep it to a minimum. But uh, this class is, is an introductory level class, and um, I think that it should give you a, a good general overview for people who are, are new to the business uh, and how things kind of tie together a little bit out in what we call the operational portion of the facility. Um, <clears throat> what we want to cover today are, are these basic areas here. We will take a look at a definition of what exactly is grain handling take a look at what types of facilities are out there to, to accomplish that. Then we'll go through some procedures, component parts of a facility, how what makes it work. Uh, again, some policies and procedures that uh, support those efforts, followed by a, a brief summation, and then hopefully a, uh, an active and lively question and discussion period. So let's start out with the, the very basics here of uh, what exactly is grain handling, a grain handling facility, what's its purpose. And as you can see here, this is a very basic definition to receive, process, store, and ship grains and oil seeds. I, I think most any of us even uh, walking in new could have, have come up with this definition. But what I'd like to do now is, is take a little closer <clears throat> look at this and, and see some of the other functions that take place. First of all, the grain elevator is, is the first step in the food, feed, and fuel supply chain. Uh, we're, we're taking that uh, commodity that's being produced by a, a grower or a farmer and getting it into the supply chain uh, that's going to distribute it to where it's needed by consumers down the line. It's the first step in that process. A grain elevator uh, I actually operates uh, in kind of a, a unique fashion in that you have two sets of customers. You have a, a farmer who's a customer that you're trying to service their needs on one end, and then you have an end user or producer or feeder on the other end. So you're, you're kind of sandwiched between. That's a unique business model that uh, not many other industries have. Uh, the third item listed here is uh, <clears throat> to provide storage and secure the world's grain related food supplies. The, a big buzzword we all hear today is sustainability and, and that's exactly what it is. We provide the security, the sustainability for the world's grain and seed reserves which is a very critical role. So you don't just work at an elevator, you, you work at a, a backstop for the world's population so they don't go hungry. Let's take a little bit closer look also at this supply chain concept that may be new to some of you. Again, it's, it's a term that's thrown around a lot recently. But it's the supply chain, as you can see here, it, it's just a simple flow diagram. We have the grower producer at the top of the box and at the end of it, we have an end user and consumer. And what we want to look at is how that flows from point A to point B and where do grain elevators fit into that equation. That is a supply chain flow diagram. So we start out with our origin country elevators. Uh, they may or may not go directly to an end user. They may, as you can see, go to a, a terminal elevator where they're loading rail or barges. 
They may go directly to a, a port facility. But as, as you flow through it, you can see there are options there, and, and each of us will have different options based on where our facilities are located and the, and the needs of our customers. And in the blue, you can see there where the processor feed or fuel is, is making that last adjustment to the, the commodity or the product before it hits the final end user. So when people talk about supply chain, this, this is a very simple flow that, that kind of explains that for our industry. We talked about uh, the types of facilities. In, in my view, there are, there are four basic types of facilities in our industry. Uh, you have in the top right-hand corner there, origination elevator, or more commonly known here as a, a country elevator. Uh, you would have one of two typically types of terminal elevators. You could have a uh, train loading terminal as depicted in the left bottom, or a, a barge loading facility in the uh, top left and then you have a port elevator and depending on where you're at that may be a import or export type facility. There are combinations and <clears throat> variations of these facilities uh, and each one will be unique. Uh, there's, there's no model that says they're all supposed to look like this, flow like this, have this size. You have to adjust it to meet your customers needs and it, it's really important that you determine what those are so that you can operate in the correct manner. From the, uh, there, we talked about we do have end users and processors who, uh, who use our product. And typically, we have feed mills, maybe straight to a feeder, uh, to a flour miller. A lot of ship wheat to, to flour miller directly, or two other some type of processor. Uh, again, to do our job effectively, we really need to know the needs of that end user, what type of product do they want, what specific specifications they want, what can they tolerate as far as error from that, what type of logistics are in place or, or transportation issues. So we need to make an effort to understand our, our customers. Even uh, for those of us who are just starting out in the elevator, I think you'll find that this is a, a very personal business. You get to know people, you get to know their families, you get to know a lot of things. That's one of the, the joys of working in this industry. So by interacting with folks as they're coming in and out of your facility, you can start learning this and learning how to support these people and uh, make them a happier customer. I want to take a look now at some of the operating procedures in an elevator, and they're, they're pretty simple, basic. We have receiving an inbound, taking the grain in from the farmer. We may be doing some type of processing to it. Uh, we'll look at that, drying, cleaning are examples. Uh, we may be putting grain away for long-term storage, or we may just be shipping it straight through, uh, depending on your facility. Uh, then we have some our outbound loadout procedures. And then the part we all love to do is there has to be some kind of documentation, paperwork to, to keep track of all these things. And then we may have some other type of processes based on the, the demands of our customers in our immediate location. <clears throat> when I um, have someone new come in and, and want to learn about the business, uh, the tool I've always used that I found extremely successful is to have a flow diagram produced by that individual. This one's a, a, an example. It's a little more complex. This typically could be a hand sketch. But the base, best way for a, a new individual to learn a facility is to go out there with a blank piece of paper after they've been on the job for a few weeks and gone through all the safety orientations and, and they know their way around and they're not going to get hurt. But go out and, and start out by sketching the area of the elevator that you're working in. If, if you're in receiving, go out and sketch the receiving portion. If, if you're doing the loadout, sketch the loadout. Understand what equipment you have in place, how it functions, what variability, flexibility you have in your operation. Then over a period of time, sit down and draw out the whole facility. This gives you the understanding of your facility as a general understanding of <clears throat> what type of functions an elevator needs to provide to their customers. When you go through this process, you should sit, sit down with your um, immediate supervisor, have them discuss it with you, answer any questions, and, and verify the accuracy. 
that this is an extremely valuable learning tool for starting out in the, in the operations portion of the business. Okay, the first uh, the operations we want to look at is receiving. <clears throat> Again, these are pretty basic definitions. This is an introductory class. But it's the physical act of, of getting that grain from the farmer. It's dumping that grain out of a truck uh, into a pit and starting the process into your facility. Now, included in this, we get into things such as sampling, grading, weighing, uh, binning the, the commodity into the correct uh, storage unit, and again, creating the appropriate documents. This will vary greatly uh, between facilities based on your design and, and needs. Uh, so, again, this isn't a one-size-fits-all. Processing is the next one of the procedures that are in place. And processing is where we're taking that commodity and we're either trying to change or maintain some aspect of it. Maybe it's moisture, maybe it's damage, maybe it's uh, FM, maybe we're sizing it, but it's, it's changing that physical appearance or improving, putting value added to that commodity, or at least trying to attempt to assist in maintaining the, the quality and integrity of the product that has came in. Again, this would include things such as scalping or, you know, coarse form material removal, cleaning of fine material, drying, aerating, sizing, polishing, cracking, and again, based on your end user, you, there, this list could be sizably larger. The storage aspect of uh, procedures will uh, be impacted by what type of business model you have in place. You take a river terminal, typically they do not have a lot of storage. Uh, grain is going in and out fairly quickly and, and so they aren't worried typically about long-term storage aspects such as a, a large country elevator maybe in, in wheat country that may be hanging on to their wheat from year to year. So the type of storage you have is based on the needs of your facility. There's, there's all kinds of different types out there. Uh, but one of the things you need to do is understand is if this area is not managed, it, it can impact your bottom line significantly for the facility. Um, shipping, uh, the physical act, this is getting the grain out of the other. We've, we've brought it in. We've processed it. We've stored it maybe uh, for you know a few months or a few weeks, depending on the case. But now we have to get it back out into some type of uh, vehicle or unit uh, to get it shipped to the customer. During this process, uh, typically you're going to see this is where our blending comes in. Uh, again, having some type of sampling and testing procedures to make sure we're, we're loading out the correct product and it's meeting the specifications and also weighing procedures where we uh, are doing billing uh, out for the customer for what has been purchased. Um, this will vary greatly from facility to facility. It's an area that is continually evolving. Uh, you need to understand that what we call the logistics piece or the transportation piece may vary. As an example, today the river systems are, are basically shut down uh, due to low water in the Mississippi River system. So we're having to look at alternate means of shipping, more by rail, more by truck. These things will occur frequently. It could be based on cost, uh, equipment availability, acts of God, whatever. So this is an area we, we must stay on top of and watch to ensure that we're using the most cost-effective mode of shipping and that our in-house procedures are set up if we're, if we're nor typically a, a barge loader and all of a sudden we have to start loading outbound trucks, what do we need to do to make that happen? Again, this is the, the part most of us uh, don't get too excited about, but there is paperwork, there is record keeping required uh, to run an operation, uh, both for your in-house profitability, knowing how much money you're making or losing, and, and to meet government regulations for Department of Transportation, tax purposes, whatever. Uh, 
the amount of records will vary greatly. What I've listed here are a few basic things we, we know we have, scale tickets and grading information. We have inventory records, maintenance records, safety records. These, these are pretty common across the board. I'd like to give you an example. I had the opportunity to work in South America for a period of time, and when you ship a, a single truck uh, from one state to another in, in Brazil, it requires over 20 documents for that one truck to, to move. So it just shows you this can be a burdensome part of the business and you, you need to stay on top of it. Now let's take a look at the component parts of an elevator. Uh, what are the, the types of equipment in there that you would use in, in each of these either areas we looked at earlier? So we talked about we have a receiving inbound we have some type of conveyance and distribution systems where we're sorting the grain within the facility. We have uh, the processing, storage, and then the loadout. We also <coughs> are going to have some type of safety systems in place. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and these would be possibly, you know, dust systems, fall protection systems, or whatever. We're going to have regulatory systems of other types, uh, maybe surface water runoff issues or whatever. And we're going to have some type of automation uh, at some facilities. Uh, it may be full-blown automation at others. The automation may be Joe going out and throwing a hand valve. That's, that's as automated as we're going to get. And then there are other utilities we need to look at. So let's start out with the receiving and the inbound component parts. Again, each facility is going to be unique. Uh, what you need to look at is if, if your facility is meeting the demand, not comparing it to your, your neighbor down the road because they may have a different need. But the logistical piece is, is the first part of that. And it's, uh, this would be <clears throat> where your truck lines are at, your rail switches, your rail yards, all that transportation issues that our trucks are coming in to your facility, how you handle those or cars coming into your facility, barges, whatever. <clears throat> the next two items, number two and three, in my mind are, are extremely critical. It's where we're doing our sampling and weighing of the inbound grain. We are paying someone for a specified quality grain based on these numbers. If these numbers are in error, uh, we can be either penalizing our operation or we can be penalizing our customer, which we do not want to do either. The sampling is very important in that we, we can't look at every kernel of grain in a, in a truck, so we try and take, quote, a representative sample that shows us as an average what is in that truck. If we do a poor job of sampling, uh, that truckload may be misrepresented and we're making the wrong assumptions what it is and we're giving it the wrong value. So we need to pay a lot of attention and follow the sampling procedures accurately. Again, <clears throat> uh, equipment will vary. Uh, some of us may have hoist. Some of us may have receiving pits uh, and rather than hoist, uh, be, hoist feeding a pit. And typically there would be coming off of the pit some type of conveyance. It might be a horizontal conveyance or a vertical conveyance, but we're moving the grain away from the pit to another place we need it. Uh, this is an area that you have a lot of movement. You have trucks and traffic in around it. You've got moving parts going up and down. So it's very important that you are alert and paying attention here to avoid error to your, or injury to yourself or someone else. Um, as far as how we control that inbound processing system, there's a, there's a number of different methods. You can see there's a bin board there where I have manual, where we're just manually writing you know, what we have in each little circle on the bin that represents uh, our elevator. Uh, we're probably going out throwing a valve or a turn head or maybe a, a manual trip or something to get the grain where it needs to go, but it, it's a pure manual. Then some of us, uh, through the years, we, uh, we had partial automation where you had a system that did part of that work for us and part of what we were still doing manually. And we've evolved now where there are some very capable, fully automated systems out there that will control your whole process, maintain your inventory records, a lot of your safety records. It's a, it's a great feature to have, uh, but uh, 
you need to be cognizant of the cost on that and does the payback justify that type of investment? Is there a return on it for you? Uh, types of conveyance, we talked about conveyance. Uh, again, these are going to vary. You can see here these are the pretty much typical. You've got a belt conveyor, you've got a mm, drag conveyor or paddle drag. Uh, you have a uh, diagram there of a, a screw conveyor. And then in some cases we may have pneumatic or air forced uh, transportation or conveyance. This again will be based on your need. There's no one recommendation that says this is better than another. You have to look at each application when you set these up. But again, uh, these are all involving movable parts. There's a great chance uh, or hazard there to, to get injured if you aren't following the correct procedures. Once we get the grain out of the pit and on a belt, typically in, a, in most facilities we are going to have to find some way to get it to the bin or to the truck or whatever, the place we want it to be. We can do that through direct spouts. We can do that through valves and typically most of the valves we use are two-way or three-way valves. Uh, and then or you may have a, a distributor, uh, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner there, what it, that is is a, a piece of equipment that has multiple spouts on it that you can select which one you want to divert the feed to. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, you have a tripper belt, which is a, a belt conveyor, but it has a, a movable spout on it that can travel up and down it and select which bin you're going to put the product into. Uh, let's, let's go on to the processing piece. Uh, again, we talked about some of these things earlier that where we're doing the cleaning, scalping, drying, blending, sizing. The, the point here is to improve the quality of the commodity that came into us to take something of, 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 of lower value and through some additional handling make it a product of a higher value. Uh, this is an area where if it's done correctly, many facilities uh, can substantially improve their profitability. Uh, if done incorrectly, it does great harm to the facility financially. So when you get involved in these type of operations, most of us have, have drying for sure, a lot of us have cleaning, that uh, we follow all the procedures and if there's any questions or concerns or misunderstanding that we discuss it with our supervisor to make sure it's done properly. The blending piece uh, is, is one that's going to take some time to learn. Uh, as we mentioned in the uh, 500 series classes through Jeeps K-State, we'll, we'll get more in depth into the blending and some of the things uh, related to the other areas of processing. We'll note that the picture down in the bottom uh, center on this, uh, some of you here may be looking at it and go, uh, what's going on there? I, I see two uh, white structures there at the end of that uh, that uh, I recognize as the shape of dryers, but what's that building in front of them? And that happens to be the fuel. Uh, most of our uh, colleagues who operate facilities in South America and other parts around the world uh, that aren't quite fully developed uh, use wood as a firewood for their dryers, which creates a whole new wood challenge uh, on how to manage that. All right, <clears throat> storage. Again, we talked about whether you're long-term or short-term storage, what type of facility you are going to impact it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now. Just these pictures will show you that all types of storage are out there. Uh, we could have hundreds of photos in here trying to depict that, but it's, it's typically going to be either short-term, long-term, or some, well, as you see in the bottom right, what we call temporary storage. Uh, you just need to be familiar with what type you have, what are the factors that impact when you're storing grain in your, your facility. Our primary interest is, is trying to maintain that quality where that grain's not heating up, getting hot, and, and going bad on us. Uh, we use a lot of different methods, but primarily aeration and, and turning of bins to control that uh, once in storage. Now I want to take a look at the shipping loadout. Uh, again, the, most of the conveyance equipment is uh, can be inbound, outbound, or moving to the facility, but we have it here. We have spouts, bins, different types of equipment. You see uh, item two under point three. 
we have ground piles out or temporary piles. We may be using some type of drain vac or a front end loader to, to get that material up and, and back into the system where we want it to be. Sampling and grading, uh, again, extremely, extremely important. The one thing I'll tell you about shipping that to be successful at it requires planning, a lot of planning. If you're loading a unit train or if you're loading barges, particularly loading a large ship, if you haven't evaluated what inventory you have in hand and how you're going to mix that together to meet your outbound specification, you're in the hole without that plan. So we should always take sufficient time to, to make a plan for what our loadout will be for that day, for that week. That plan is communicated, and if anyone has any questions on that, that they don't make a guess or an assumption, and they, they talk with their supervisor, maybe someone over in the commercial department to verify that it uh, is going to be done to the customer's wishes and needs. This is a little busy, but I wanted to kind of show you. Uh, we work in a country elevator. We work in a, a terminal. Sometimes we don't understand <clears throat> how all this ties together. Uh, this chart <clears throat> depicts the different forms of transportation. You see vessels, barges, rail cars, trucks. Uh, most of the world, we are, we're dealing in metric tons. So I put a column in there for metric tons here uh, in the States. It's, we're more bushels. These are approximates. The numbers can vary. But as, as you can see, a, a typical Panamax vessel is going to hold about 2 million plus bushels of grain, maybe 2.1 million bushels of grain. If you look at the columns over there on the right, <clears throat> that would take two and a half 15 barge tows uh, to fill that Panamax. It take a little over five and a half 100 car unit trains to fill that Panamax, and it take over around 2,300, 2,400 trucks to fill that Panamax. That gives you an idea of the scope and scale. And you know, we'll look at a country elevator. We may anymore. It's it's pretty common to see a 20,000 bushel leg in a country elevator. It's not unusual at all. But to go to some golf facilities and, and you're seeing 60, 80, 100,000 bushel an hour elevation equipment, and it's because of this scale that they're working on. But I, I hope this helps give you a little idea of how this all ties together from a country elevator all the way through. Safety systems are very important in a grain handling facility. <clears throat> Typically, we're going to have some type of fire, dust, explosion equipment. We're going to have guarding, fall protection. You can see the rest listed here. This is not an all-inclusive list. There could be many more. These are the basics. Uh, each company, each country is going to have different requirements, and it's just that you need to be familiar with what is in your facility and follow the programs. Same with regulatory systems. Uh, again, we, we need to control dust. We all know that that's out there. We, uh, sometimes it's noise issues we must deal with. You know, if you've got a dryer, you're running in the middle of the night, and you've got a neighbor next door. Water management, uh, we're not getting stuff into to creeks and streams, surface runoff. Traffic flow, where we haven't got the town shut down because we got the railroad crossing blocked for two days, or we got truck lines backed up and people can't get into local businesses, and then navigational issues uh, for those of you on the waterways. Talked a little bit about automation earlier, and automation can be used in, in almost every area of the plant, and I just tried to, to list those here. The automation, uh, again, is going to vary facility to facility. It can be used in a number of, of different areas. The thing I like to tell people here is, is use the, you know, the test. Does my need justify the expense for this? Uh, because it, it's expensive to install. It, it takes some work to train people and pe keep people current in, in the automation as you update it. If, if you're bringing in seasonal people, uh, you know, make sure you have a plan in place to train them how to use your automated systems properly. <clears throat> the other areas we have are we may need to update or to monitor our compressed air systems, uh, generators, and etc. A couple comments on compressed air. Um, historically, we've used compressed air to for cleanup purposes, blowing down equipment. 
which is fine as long as we do that when the equipment's been shut off and the area's been secured from any type of ignition source. Uh, we don't want to be blowing down while we have equipment running. The other thing we've used compressed air for <clears throat> is blowing that dust off our shirt and our pants when we get ready to go home at night. And uh, that's, that's fine to do if it's done correctly and, and that needs to be done with air that's 30 PSI or less or we risk some, some personal injury there. <clears throat> the programs in place, uh, we have safety programs which uh, we will discuss further in, in some of the 500 series classes and in this webinar we'll have a, a one devoted to a safety. Cost management is, is looking at how we manage our, our grain, we're looking at our shrink, we're looking at our grading procedures, we're looking at our labor costs, our fuel costs, the energy costs. So we need to manage those areas of our facilities going to be successful. Uh, quality management, uh, that grain is not getting out of shape. We're turning that grain, we're walking out there inspecting it, smelling, feeling it to make sure that we're not having any loss or degradation. And then we have the uh, regulatory and customer services is one I'd like to speak to a little bit. <clears throat> Typically we don't talk a lot about customer service, but we need to know what our customers' needs are. That farmer that's going to be uh, delivering grain to us this fall, what what type of grain is it going to be? Is it going to be corn or beans this year? Uh, when's it going to come in? Did he get in early before the rains or did was he after the rains and had to set and wait before he planted? When, when's he going to deliver to you? Did he get a new truck? It's not going to be coming in on that farm wagon or, or farm truck this year. He's contracted a couple guys with semis to bring that grain in. Those are things we need to know to service that customer. The same token, we need that two-way communication back. He needs to know what are our truck hours. When 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 can he come in? Uh, you know, our dryer's backed up. Uh, what a grain can he bring into us? You need to be fair and consistent. But anyway, uh, we talked about you know, no surprises uh, on weights or grades coming in. Uh, surprises make everyone unhappy. Dependability, that facility needs to be ready to go at harvest. If we um, miss a week of harvest, uh, it can greatly impact our bottom line. So I have a preventative maintenance program out there and, and you have that facility ready to go. Providing the service, truck lines, drying. Uh, customer service, uh, nobody wants to sit there and wait for a long time at the elevator. He's got a, a big new combine he's bought out there. He's got a, a truck uh, that he's just purchased. If they're sitting idle, it's costing his, him money. He's going to go somewhere else where he can get dumped quickly. So we need to provide that service. And again, we need to provide accurate and timely documents. So in summary, um, you know, the basics of grain handling is, is pretty easy. We're, we're bringing grain in and we're, we're doing some simple processing to it and shipping it out. So it's, it's bulk handling, point A to point B with some simple processing if you look at it that. But as we get into the detail in, in further classes, you're going to see it, there's a lot more in each of the areas than, than meet the eye and it's going to take some time to learn it. Some of the things such as when you get into doing blending where you're, you're blending uh, multiple factors into it, it takes a lot of experience and hands-on knowledge to become efficient and effective at it. Grain handling facilities are that critical part of the, the food chain. Uh, the world is depending on, on grains in particular to offset hunger and we are the keepers of that grain. Uh, the world's asked us to, to be sure that it's available for them and it's in good quality and, and quantities. Grain handling facilities by their nature and design present some hazards. We have a lot of moving equipment. Uh, we have uh, heights involved where there's possible uh, falls involved. We always need to be cognizant of the hazards around us. We need to understand them. We need to know how to avoid them and we must never take any shortcuts uh, because when you start
start taking shortcuts. You may get by with it the first or second time, but eventually it's going to catch you and you're going to pay the price. Just kind of a little disclaimer here from a terminology standpoint. I know if there's some people outside the U.S. watching this that we use different terminologies, and, and I apologize. We, we had to pick one, and, and most of our viewers are here in North America. Uh, your government or your company policies may require that you do some things differently than maybe they looked like they were presented here, and, and you need to follow whatever your company or, or government regulations are. And the photos used in this were not uh, trying to recommend any type of equipment or design. They were, were just for illustrating the topic. Stu had mentioned the Jeeps 500 series, and here's a list of the 10 classes available in the Jeeps 500 series coming up. Uh, I encourage you to take advantage of these. They will go into a lot more detail. Uh, they're great learning tools. Uh, if interested, the four in yellow, number one, four, seven, and ten, I will be presenting later in the year. Those are our distance learning classes. So with that, uh, Stu will open it up to questions. Jim, I appreciate that. We've got uh, some very good ones here. Let's go through these very quickly because I know a lot of people uh, will need to be on with their day. Uh, first one, uh, someone who is new to the uh, ethanol production and grain handling industry, wondering about uh, your professional opinion on the outlook for that industry. Well, um, my personal feeling is the outlook is good for, for our business. You, you look at everyone has to eat. One of the, the basic sources of, of food for this world is, is grain. Uh, wheat, rice, corn, soybeans, and the list goes on and on. So there's always going to be a need. Now, will the business change? Yes. Uh, I think we've seen consolidation in the business. We've seen technology changes. Uh, the equipment is a lot larger than it used to be. And what we, we need to look at is, and that gets back to this thing of, of customer service and customer needs, we need to look forward and anticipate what our individual customers in our area are going to be looking for, and we need to start preparing for that. Uh, if, you go, if you go back 15, 20 years ago, most country elevator legs were, were 5,000 bushel legs. Uh, that would not be satisfactory today. So. I think the industry has a strong future. It's going to continue to evolve, and we need to plan to take advantage of that. Jim, uh, another question uh, regarding uh, uh, the use of the terminology for blending. Uh, gentleman asking if that means mixing grain so that it does not exceed quality specifications. And uh, do elevators have to physically mix it when they blend? Okay. You know, blending is, is typically look at your, your taking. One is there are regulations on how you blend, and I suggest for those of you in the U.S., if you want to see the detail on it, you can go into the FGIS handbook, and it has a lot of very clearly defined definitions on how and what and what not you can do. That's the best source to go to look at. But um, typically we're, we're not mixing Unlike grains, we're not going to mix corner beans, and we're not going to, you know, mix high FM that's full of damage at, at extreme levels. There are limits with what you can blend. Uh, typically, the most of the things we see blended, uh, we're going to blend moistures. Uh, the wheat, you'll see proteins blended quite a bit. We'll we'll blend a little bit for FM and and you know, form material, but. It's, it's taking something of a lesser value and, and trying to upgrade it with where you have some bins of a greater value. Um, how you do that is going to be determined within your company and within the regulations uh, that you're working in and what your customer wants. Jim, how do uh, companies typically provide entry-level training for those who are involved in grain handling? Well, traditionally, what we've done, it's, it's been uh, learn on the job. They'll, they'll put you out. If, if you're new and you're going to be dumping trucks, they'll put you out on the, the truck pit and with the guy that's been dumping trucks, and he's going to instruct you. 
that has been our training method of choice for years and years. Uh, what I would, would suggest is that we modify that model and that we have some in-house, simple in-house training programs uh, such as these type of classes, these type of programs where he could go into a, a binning model and, and get some specific training on how to do that properly and then you apply that to your company's regulations. You could write these programs internal, you could use external programs uh, from a consultant or for, through Jeeps is a, is a great source. Some of the universities have some good information on, on this type of thing. But do that well, more formal training and not rely on somebody to provide that unsupervised training where he may be teaching the bad habits. How oh, um, uh, we you had a rail car in in the uh, one of your pictures uh, with a capacity of 3,550 bushels. Is that current rail car capacity? Again, that's just uh, that's a rough average. You know, there's rail cars uh, that you know run down as low as 40 to uh, to on up over you know 100 ton. It's so it, it's a number I just plugged in that was kind of considered an average. Uh, some of the new super jumbos are, will probably have a higher capacity than that for sure. Yes. Okay. Um, you'd mentioned heat in stored material. Uh, any comments on? Spontaneous combustion in uh, uh, in grain, uh, uh, temperatures, moisture, et cetera. A yeah. Brief overview on that. Yeah, you know, grains are a, a biological material. They are susceptible to spontaneous combustion. If we have excessive moistures and and do not have air m movement in there over the period of time, that grain will heat to the point where it can self ignite. Now, typically, that becomes a, more of a, a smolder, not an open flame. But uh, if we aren't watching moistures, if we don't have good airflow through those bins, uh, that is uh, to be expected that we're going to see that, yes. The okay. higher the moisture, the, the greater the risk. Any thoughts on that newest OSHA ruling regarding sweep augers? Uh, as a person who has seen a lot of scars through the years, I support any effort to increase the safety for employees. Uh, I think, you know, there's a, you can write a plan uh, that will allow you to safely get in the bin if I've, I've looked at that correctly. Uh, I have a, I'm not real current on it and I'll follow up on that to make sure, but I think the best thing is, is to work with your suppliers, your manufacturers, so that you can keep people out of that bin and, and get the grain out of it. We've got um, a gentleman who uh, uh, really wishes you the best here and gives you his thanks for doing this today under adverse circumstances, but he said he sat in on the webinar today as uh, use it as part of an orientation for new employees and certainly respects and appreciate your understanding of the current state of the industry. And Tim Sullivan wishes you uh, the best and to uh, get well. Well, thank you, Tim. <laughs> um, we, uh, uh, our time is at an end here. I uh, want to remind you of the dates for the next one. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you to Jim Voigt of JFB Solutions in Mount Zion, Illinois, uh, for our very informative program. Uh, and uh, we want to certainly thank again our sponsors, Gamut and the Food Protection Alliance. And there's certainly uh, uh, your uh, uh, good contact information for those two organizations as well as Jim uh, they're on the screen in front of you. Hey thanks also to Greg Sullivan our webinar editor for assisting with the uh, presentation today. Uh, again that uh, uh, safety e-newsletter uh, you can find out about that. You can find out about uh, our uh, adventure on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, if you go to our website uh, at uh, grainnet.com, G-R-A-I-N-N-E-T.com, uh, to uh, uh, join any of our groups, uh, uh, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn, or to sign up for our safety e-newsletter. For those of you who tuned in late or did not get a chance to uh, hear the entire uh, webinar, uh, it'll be posted to our uh, website within 24 hours and uh, you can pick that up at grainnet.com slash webinars. Now, 
the dates again for the next one. So uh, Jim will be back with us on Thursday, March 7th on Keys to a Successful Brain Operation. Uh, we'll be visiting with him again on June 20th about getting home safely and uh, again on uh, August 1st uh, with a checklist uh, as we head into the harvest season. We also want to remind you about the upcoming Jeeps K-State Distance Education course, the Jeeps 500 Introduction to Grain Operations. Uh, this uh, webinar series is really kind of a sneak peek into that. That course is one of six necessary to obtain your credential uh, for uh, grain operations management. And you can visit the Jeeps website to get more information on that and other courses. If you uh, would like to participate uh, uh, either in putting on a webinar uh, or sponsoring a webinar, uh, please give us a call. You can contact either Mark Avery or Greg Sullivan here at the Grain Journal. Our 800 number is 800-728-7511. On behalf of Greg and Jim Voigt, I'm Stu Ellis wishing you a good day. Thank you for listening.